In March of 2013, an internet firestorm erupted when TED, the renowned series of global conferences, chose to remove from its YouTube channel the talk of the acclaimed author and biologist, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. According to TED, their decision was based on the advice of an anonymous scientific board that claimed Dr. Sheldrake's talk crossed the line into pseudoscience and contains serious factual errors and many misleading statements. Dr. Sheldrake refuted these claims, after which TED crossed out its original public statement. The issue remains open for discussion on the official TED blog, and thousands of commenters have voiced their disapproval of TED's actions. We asked Dr. Sheldrake to offer his own perspective on these recent events. My TED talk started with some girls, some charming girls in London asking me to do it at their TEDx event. They were 22-year-old students. And at first I said no, because I said I didn't like the TED business model where they pay their speakers nothing and make tens of millions a year out of conference revenues. And she said, oh, no, they weren't charging lots of money, and that wasn't like that. And then um, at first I said no. Then it turned out that these girls were friends of my son, Cosmo. And he then asked me and said he was going to perform at their event, and they really wanted me to do it, and would I do it? So under pressure from my own son, I agreed to do it. And their event was called Challenging Existing Paradigms, so that made sense. And um, they were charming and delightful to work with, and the event was a great success. And the crowd there were friendly and interesting. It sold out weeks beforehand. And then they put up the, the talk on the TEDx site following all the standard procedures. And all went well for about two months until it came to the attention of Jerry Coyne, who then uh, wrote a blog denouncing TED um, for providing a platform for my talk and uh, attacking me. So something that had just gone on in a perfectly normal, calm way in the normal TED format. Uh, and my talk had had about 35,000 views on the TEDx website. Uh, suddenly resulted in this tremendous controversy. Now, I didn't know anything about the controversy. I was traveling in a remote part of India with my wife when this burst. And you know, I didn't get emails. And when I did, I got started getting emails about what's going on and this controversy. They might take your talk down. They opened a discussion forum on whether to take my talk down. And 10 to 1, the people on the forum said, no, don't take it down. So they took it down anyway. And then um, banned or took down the talk by Graham Hancock and put them in the special naughty corner of the internet uh, with a kind of health warning by their science board saying it was pseudoscience. So um, they then published a statement from the science board saying why they thought it was pseudoscience. And the, the, state, the statement was so ludicrously wrong. You know, it said that um, my remarks on the speed of light had all been refuted and it didn't drop by 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1945. It was very easy to show that, in fact, it did. And, um, you know, the figures they quoted simply left out those dates. Um, it was very easy to refute every one of their points, which I did. So they then struck out the science board statement, published my um, refutation, and mo tried to move the debate on to another blog. They kept moving blogs to try and shake off this very hostile discussion thread. Altogether, the, the taking down of my talk um, uh, resulted in more than 5,000 comments on TED discussion threads, more than any other TED talk in history. And after they took it down and put it in the naughty corner, it, it went up on a whole range of, of uh, kind of um, pirate websites, uh, as well as their official naughty corner. Uh, and on, it's on at least 12 of other sites now. And I just looked at two or three of them the other day, and the total views on those came to more than 200,000. So when you add in the ones on Ted's own site and all the other pirate sites, it must be getting on for over half a million by now. So the number of views has gone up enormously since they um, tried to um, ban the talk. When they first banned it, it was going very badly for Ted. Their reputation was in shreds and lots of their fans were deeply disillusioned. Um, 
And I think it created a kind of existential crisis. Um, and Chris Anderson, the head of it, emailed me and asked if he could speak to me. So he rang me up and we had a, a long conversation, um, you know, nearly an hour. Um, and I, I got on quite well with him. Um, I think that he regretted rushing into removing these these talks, mine and Hancock's. Um, but he was also kind of a captive of circumstance by then, and they had to justify it. I think it wasn't just Jerry Coyne, it was also P.Z. Myers, who's a, a similarly an atheist, um, a militant atheist blogger. Um, I think what's the reason that these this small group of militant atheists and dogmatic skeptics punch so far above their weight is that they claim to speak with the authority of science. They claim to speak for the scientific community, and they speak in the name of science. Now, that gives them a huge authority insofar as people believe them, because science has enormous authority, and you know, everything in the modern world depends on it. So um, by claiming to speak in the name of science, they borrow the authority of science uh, to give their own opinions vastly greater weight than they ought to have. This is, of course, a standard tactic among militant atheists. Richard Dawkins is the primary example. Uh, Richard Dawkins, um, when he was a professor at Oxford, was not professor of zoology or evolution. He was professor of the public understanding of science. And he spoke as professor of the public understanding of science. And therefore, people assumed that with that authority and a chair at Oxford, um, <clears throat> he was speaking for science. And for him, science equals atheism, not just atheism, but militant atheism. Um, and a lot of the media have actually bought into that. Um, I think it's partly because many people in the media are themselves either atheists or very sympathetic to the atheist point of view. Um, so that means that they get easy platform for their views in, in the mainstream media, especially in the science, uh, among science correspondents. And the other thing is that the skeptic groups are very well organized. For years now, the, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, or PSYCOP, have been running the Skeptical Inquiry magazine, which has a circulation of at least 50,000. Then there's Michael Shermer's Skeptic magazine, uh, again, about 50,000, I think. Then there's the British Skeptic magazine. So we've got, you know, tens of thousands, over 100,000 skeptics, um, regular paid up subscribers to Skeptic magazines, plus large numbers of people who go to Skeptic websites, who use this position, this label of skeptic, to justify a kind of atheist, materialist point of view, and to use their skeptical stance as a way of uh, propagating this point of view militantly. Now, the skeptic organizations don't just publish their own magazines. They have a very effective campaign with the press. I discovered this years ago. I once did an interview for USA Today. Uh, a simp they'd get, they had a very sympathetic reporter, and they did a one-page spread about my work on dogs that know when their owners are coming home and other research on psychic pets. And when the um, article came out, the reporter rang me almost in tears uh, soon afterwards to say that the editor of the USA Today had had this angry phone call from a member of the skeptic organization saying they discredited their newspaper, that I was a, a pseudo-scientist and a charlatan and they'd been duped. And in future, any stories they um, wrote about telepathy or nonsense like that should be checked with the proper scientific authorities, namely themselves, first, so they could issue a comment. Uh, so this kind of proactive way of influencing the media, attacking the people who provide the platform. They attack the editors. It's no coincidence that Coyne attacked Ted. He attacked Ted more than he attacked me. Is their way of trying to maintain um, a control over what appears in the serious media. So now the, they also have, um, the, in the Skeptical Inquirer last year, I subscribed to it because I feel I need to know what they're up to. Um, I also subscribed to the British Skeptic magazine. There was an article by a woman skeptic, 
advocating skeptics to get involved in their campaign to make sure that Wikipedia reflects what they see as the true scientific position on things like telepathy and pseudoscience. And they have lots of people who are, well, I don't know how many, but they have a significant number of dedicated activists um, working in Wikipedia, uh, making sure that at every possible, in every possible way it reflects the materialist and skeptic point of view. Um, and they le they've learned the rules, they've become expert editors, and they've infiltrated uh, Wikipedia. Um, because, as they uh, argued in the Skeptical Inquirer, this is where most children and students get their information from, and indeed where most people get their information from. So it's very important for them that it reflects the skeptical point of view. So they've had a determined campaign, and I think it's a, probably a relatively small group of activists, but they're committed, active, proactive, uh, whereas people who work in psychical research or in other branches of more unconventional science haven't been spending their time um, trying to influence the media and get their message to dominate the airwaves. They've been getting on with doing their research. So I think that's uh, the reason they've got into this position. And I think the other reason they've been so successful is that there's nothing new in this campaign. If you look back to the late 19th century, skeptics and materialists were carrying out very much the same kind of campaign against psychical research even then. And this kind of aggressive, scornful, dismissive style of polemic uh, was already well in place in the 19th century. Uh, nothing much has changed, really, except that um, they now have even more media to put their view across in. And um, they probably increased their, their influence over the serious media.